gentlemen, thank you very, very much for coming. My name is Liceo Newman. I'm the director of the Africa Institute of American Jewish Committee, which is the building where you find yourselves today. Um, today is, uh, <coughs> is a sunny, warm day in New York, but the events that we commemorate were um, one of the darkest chapters of a 20th century that was ending in optimism. Uh, the same year, democracy was returning to South Africa, and the world was distracted. Um, after several cries of never again, there wasn't again. And um, that is what has spawned a um, very vibrant debate about the specifics of the events in Rwanda, and also the universal message what needs to be done and how it can be done. What can be done can only be done in partnership, and we are especially proud of the partnership that brings together a few of organizers for this Kuguka 2025, which is the 25th year after the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Uh, in conversation with the ambassador today, we were talking about the effect of time on how an event like the genocide against the Tutsi gets conceptualized and spoken about. Um, much the same happened with the Holocaust, which is an entity it took time to take hold and dimension. Survivors were too focused on the personal aspects and how to cope with having overcome, sometimes by chance, sometimes by determination, sometimes with the help of others, an event like that. And while many people have focused academically and through NGOs and the like, it's opportunities like this that bring together <clears throat> people from different walks of life to um, all their understanding, their empathy, and their knowledge and experience. So I want to acknowledge the partners that um, joined us today. There is, uh, first and foremost, the permanent mission of Rwanda to the United Nations. There's also the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect. Um, there's the Global Center for the uh, Responsibility to Protect and also the New York City Bar Association. Uh, we'll have um, a few opening remarks by some representatives of those organizations and then we will have two panels which will usher in a new course. Um, first is Marion Bergman. Marian uh, is the chair of the Af founding chair of the Africa Institute and also a member of the board of the Jacob Blaustein Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights at AJC, which is one of the seminal institutes at AJC, an organization which um, advocated for the inclusion of human rights language in the charter of the UN. Uh, the then president of AJC, Jacob Blaustein, an oil man, a business guy having seen what happened in the genocide, thought that any international configuration of the kind that the UN would intend to be in San Francisco would, um, would be founded on the principle of, of, of never again. Um, so, Marion, please, please come on. Thank you. Thank you, Elisea. Good afternoon. Um, Ambassador, Rubwabiza, distinguished participants and colleagues, thank you for joining us for this important conference convened as we mark this year with great sorrow the 25th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi, which shocked the world and made it clear that despite the efforts of many, including the American Jewish Committee, the world had plainly failed to absorb the lessons of the Holocaust. Today, we are pleased to welcome the mission of Rwanda to the United Nations as we continue our efforts to remember the victims of genocides and to take effective action at the United Nations and beyond to prevent the future commission of this crime. AJC founded our Africa Institute in 2006 so that our leadership would become better edu educated about a continent that is so often lost in our news cycles. The objective was to find interlocutors who share our values and join voices in advocating for common causes in our challenging world. Rwanda stands apart in Africa. It was the first country in Africa where AJC facilitated the deployment of Israeli technical experts the year after the Institute's launch. 
and it was the first country in Africa into which we sent a delegation of our most senior leadership in 2017. Hosted, I'm sorry, 2017. Hosted as we were by President Kagame and then Foreign Minister Louise Mushiki Wabo. The first ever learning mission to Africa by our young leadership division was also to Rwanda to educate them on the tragic events whose victims we seek to commemorate today. This commemoration will examine important themes, including the ongoing need to fight impunity for genocide. and the aftermath of the Holocaust, AJC supported the establishment of the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials and also worked closely with Raphael Lemkin, the Polish-Jewish legal scholar who coined the term genocide and who drafted much of what became the 48th Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Following its adoption by the UN, AJC collaborated with Raphael Lemkin to press countries to join the Genocide Convention. AJC particularly stepped up its pressure on the United States to ratify the convention following the establishment of the Jacob Blaustein Institute in 1971. The Institute later published a monograph on Lemkin and his vital work to name the crime of genocide and continues to call on more than 40 states that have not yet ratified the Genocide Convention to do so. HSC has also fought impunity for the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. HSC called for the United Nations Security <coughs> Council to establish the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in order to ensure that the architects and leading figures responsible for genocide would be brought to justice. Jacob Blaustein Institute convened meetings with the prosecutor of the tribunal and called on the states to provide it with adequate funds to carry out its investigations and to protect witnesses. Jacob Blaustein Institute also pressed the diplomats that were drafting the tribunal's founding statute and called on them to address the full range of crimes committed against victims of the genocide and specifically to recognize rape and other sexual violence in war as an international criminal offense. While we recognize the important work of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, we note the continuing need to hold perpetrators, perpetrators of that genocide accountable. And the 25 years since the Blaustein Institute's work has also focused specifically on the need for international attention to the question of what steps states can take alone or acting together, including through the United Nations to prevent genocide in the future as the Genocide Convention requires. The Blaustein Institute pressed the UN to carry out work to elaborate what genocide prevention entails and to that end called for the creation of a special advisor to the UN Secretary General on the prevention of genocide the first UN post to explicitly address and advise UN leadership on genocide-related issues. Once that post was created, the Blaustein Institute worked closely with special advisor Adama Dieng and his office and developed a set of human rights-related risk factors for the prevention of genocide, along with a manual setting out practical steps that states can take to prevent them. AJC has worked to improve the United States government's response to emerging risks of genocide and take effective action to mitigate them as well. For example, we pressed members of Congress from around the country to support the Elie Cell Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act, which after several years was finally signed into law in January of this year. We've also pressed states to combat impunity for genocide and take steps to prevent it. In 2015, we joined the call for the UN to designate December 9 as the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and of the Prevention of this Crime. Today, we are honored to come together with our friends from the Mission of Rwanda to the United Nations and our distinguished panelists, 
to remember the victims of the genocide. We look forward to these discussions about the work that remains to be done to ensure the tragic events in Rwanda are not forgotten and to make more effective the world's response to the threat or commission of genocide in the future. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Martine Numa of the UN Office on the Prevention of Genocide and their Responsibility to Protect. Thank you. Your Excellency, Ambassador Wabiza, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of Mr. Adam Adyeng, the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, our office is honored to co-sponsor this event. We thank the permanent mission of Rwanda for extending invitation to us. As we will see during the discussion, fighting impunity is very integral to the prevention of genocide and other atrocity crimes. We have learned a lot from the genocide against the Tutsi, in which Modere Hutu and others were also killed in 1994. In the aftermath of the genocide, Rwanda invested heavily in fighting impunity as one of the key measures to prevent possibility of recurrence. Firstly, Rwanda cooperated with the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, but also acknowledging fully that the, this international instrument could only hold a few high-level perpetrators. Measures were put in place to reform national courts to deal with middle-level perpetrators. The role of the Gashasha court was very significant, not only in dealing with low-level perpetrators, but also by <coughs> taking to justice, to the grassroots, and using traditional mechanisms to fight impunity, promote national reconciliation, and healing. We applaud the non-impunity measures that were put in place. And today, Rwanda is one of the shining examples, not only in Africa, but also in the world on fighting impunity. This must be replicated <coughs> in other places where atrocity crimes have been committed because impunity only fuels more violence and atrocity crimes. The lessons we have learned are alive with us today. We know that genocide or other atrocity crimes are not single events but processes. Therefore, it is possible to identify one inside that they, may, they might occur. Let us all join hands in this 25th commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi and fight impunity and ensure justice for all victims of genocide and other atrocity crimes. This constitutes an integral part of prevention. Thank you. And last but, but not least uh, is Ambassador Valentin Rukwagiza. Um, she was appointed Rwanda's ambassador to Switzerland and permanent representative to the UN office in Geneva, <coughs> serving three years um, from 2005 to 2013. She was deputy director general of the World Trade Organization, the first woman to hold that position. <coughs> Uh, she was also CEO of the Rwandan Development Board from 2013 to 2014 and served as, as Minister for East African Community Affairs from 2014 to 16, holding her current, current post since 2016. Ambassador, it's her pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much, Eliseo. Uh, uh, good evening. 
Uh, first of all, I would really like to thank very, very much the African Institute of uh, HEC for hosting, uh, hosting all of us, hosting this event. And I would like to thank all of you, all of you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, a special thanks uh, to all the speakers who are going to share with us uh, their expertise and their experience. So my words will really not be uh, long, it's really to, to thank all of you. We'll have the opportunity to interact during the interactive uh, sessions. Uh, let me just uh, say that uh, 25, uh, and, and of course my colleagues, ambassadors, permanent representatives, diplomats, uh, whom I acknowledge here in the, in the room, uh, it was very important for us to have this conversation outside the UN environment. Uh, sometimes we have noticed uh, that sometimes within the UN environment, um, the freedom of flow doesn't flow that well. So sometimes it's better to have conversations where we really want people to be able to speak openly uh, outside, outside the, 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 the UN uh, environment, and this is what we hope for this afternoon conversation. We've learned few lessons uh, from, from, from the genocide uh, against the Tutsi. As Rwandans, we have learned few lessons. We'll have the opportunity to share some of those lessons. But one lesson that we have learned that is very important is that uh, indifference has a huge cost. Indifference comes uh, at a very huge cost, and that every one has a role to play when there is a crime of such magnitude that is happening. Even if that role is only to denounce, it makes a huge difference. All those who stood up, who were in Rwanda in 1994, there are few of them. Carl Wilkins, there are few of them. All those who stood up were able to save hundreds and sometimes thousands of lives. All the survivors have survived because someone at one point decided that they were going, they were not going to ignore their humanity. That's why we have few survivors. Most of the survivors survived because a very young army, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, very young, very young soldiers led by President Kagame, took upon them after seeing that we were being abandoned by the entire world. They took upon them and they started the campaign to stop the genocide. It took them three months. During those three months, more than a million of our people, more than a million Tutsi were killed. Saying the right thing, saying the truth, the truth doesn't, the truth, the truth needs soldiers. And we are all soldiers of the truth. We can all be naturalists. And saying the truth can make a huge difference. We have here representatives of Nigeria. In 1994, on the Security Council, the then ambassador of Nigeria, Ambassador Gambari, was one of the only three ambassadors who decided to stand up and to say no. People are being exterminated for who they are targeted to be, for who they are identified to be. It was in minority. However, today, 25 years later, their position, their stand, their words continue to constitute part of the memory of Rwanda for the times to come. He and the ambassador of New Zealand and the ambassador of the Czech Republic at the time they were the only three to stand up and to say, no, what is happening? We need to do something. They were not the world powers. However, they uphold humanity. 
they really took seriously the responsibility that we all has to the we all and our ops in the Security Council. And we keep repeating that because we want people, countries that are today sitting on the Security Council to understand exactly what is the weight of their responsibility. So those are among the few lessons that we have learned. Another lesson that we have learned is that we should absolutely be vigilant vis-a-vis -vis all expressions of hatred. We have to remain vigilant. It is, and, and, and be careful to not allow a group of people or a community to be stigmatized as being less deserving of life. It is our collective responsibility to denounce that in the strongest term, but also to act, to take action when needed. It is our responsibility whenever we are faced with that. We might think that some of those people are far from our reality. Our lesson, again, is that it's never very far from our reality. If it is allowed in one place, it creates what is called, in a very simple terms, a precedent. Then it's a, if it was allowed there, why shouldn't it be allowed elsewhere? So we have we have learned few of those lessons. I won't take much longer time. I think we are going to listen to the experts, and we really have those. I'm very grateful that they accepted uh, our joint invitation. Uh, we, we, we are really uh, going to listen to people who have a direct, a primary experience of fighting for the truth and fighting against impunity. It is very important to know exa and, and to inform ourselves, to know that in the countries and in the communities where we are living, there are people who perpetrated the, the genocide, who are trying to recreate new identities for themselves. It is important to be informed and to know about them and to know that people should be held accountable. Not because, not for, for the principle of accountability, no. Because accountability is an effective mean of prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Um, now we'll, we'll start our first panel. Uh, it will take us 45 minutes. We'll briefly introduce Simon Adams, who is going to be the moderator. Uh, Mr. Adams has worked extensively with civil society organizations in South Africa, East Timor, Rwanda, and elsewhere between 1994 and 2002. He worked with Sinn Féin and former IRA prisoners in support of the Northern Ireland peace process. He is also a former anti-apartheid activist and a former member of the African National Congress of South Africa. <clears throat> he is the author of four books on international conflict. He has also written for the New York Times and appears as an expert commentator on Al Jazeera, BBC, and numerous other media regarding issues of mass atrocity prevention and international justice. He is currently the uh, executive director of the uh, Global Institute on the Responsibility to Protect, and uh, we welcome and uh, with gratitude for joining us. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I, can, I, I can call them. Um, the honorary is Martin Goga, the Speaker of the Fourth East African Legislative Assembly and former Prosecutor General of Rwanda. Uh, Professor Scharf, Dean of Case Western Law School and Professor of Law, um, Ms. Simone Monasadian, Director of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, New York Office. And Ezra Sack Kaufman, Senior Fellow at Harvard University and Lecturer in Law and Fellow at Stanford Law School.
thank you for that, and uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. I think my mum would have been very happy if she was here today to hear that. Or maybe not. Uh, I had a experience that she wasn't very keen on me doing. We've got a, a great panel here, and uh, I won't. They're so esteemed. I won't read out the bios of each and every one of them, or else we might not have any time to do anything else. But what we did want to do is give each of our speakers uh, a chance to address the topic. And then we do actually want to open it up to the audience here to have an opportunity to, to question them, to, to make uh, uh, comments and so forth. I should say that this first panel has the uh, title of Preserving Memory, Cooperation and Responsibility in the Fighting of Punity and Genocide Denial. It's a very heavy uh, topic to say to the very least. Uh, but why don't we start off with the Honourable Speaker uh, as our first speaker in this panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for having me on the panel. Um, I'm really not an expert, but um, I always share uh, what I have learned through the process. Uh, as a prosecutor, uh, we started off prosecuting perpetrators of genocide from the very beginning, for almost 10 years continuously. And for four years that I spent uh, in the public gallery of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, listening to each and every witness. So what I have, and what I'm willing to share with you is, is that experience, not, not expertise as such. Um, but briefly and in general terms, uh, we need to realize, to start from a major premise, that genocide is a processual crime. It's a crime that is a process, a result of a process. And a process that takes time. And in a specific case of Rwanda, it's a process that took more than 30 years of institutionalization of the police of division, of teaching division through school curriculum, of episodes of mass murder that would be followed by legislations of amnesty and reward to those who were involved, who perpet the perpetrators of those murders. And all those internal processes of preparing for the eventual maturity of genocide uh, could not have succeeded if there had not been a big role of bystanders, those who became indifferent to what was going on. Uh, I grew up in a neighboring country. I was not in Rwanda. But what I was being taught in that neighboring country was a totally different of what my age mates were being taught in Rwanda. So just as genocide is a crime that is a product of a process, I think what we are addressing today is what do we need to, to undo that process? Because stopping the genocide is not an end in itself. And doing the ideology of, of genocide is another long and probably equally challenging process. Uh, and this is where we find denial, which is evidence that the ideology of genocide is still lively. This is where we still find indifference, international indifference. That is why we have invited 1,089 perpetrators who are spread across 33 countries and the only 20 have been sent back to one at first trial and 23 have been prosecuted in the countries where they live under the arrangement of universal jurisdiction. So what more evidence of indifference do we need? Uh, 25 years after the genocide, uh, we have succeeded to access that percentage of perpetrators in the era of mobility of information and witnesses and a comparatively easier process of sharing evidence than it was when we agreed as a community of nations that this genocide should not happen again. So that is the process. When we started in Rwanda, we started from a point of identifying the perpetrators 
when we didn't know whether we'd even find witnesses. Because that was the situation. Those who were arrested perpetrators, kept them in custody, continued with the operation to stop the genocide, were not the ones to come and tell us the circumstances under which they had been arrested. There was a point where we had to rely on the perpetrators themselves to know the circumstances of the arrest. So it's been a long process, and it's a process that calls for solidarity. Those who are, uh, because I don't think the choice is between, uh, there is no middle ground. It's either being part of the process to make a commitment that a genocide shouldn't happen again, or being a part of the process that can provide another possibility for the genocide to happen again. So that, that is the reality check. We have perpetrators here in America, we have them in Europe, we have them everywhere. They are known by names, by address, but it is still very difficult to bring them to justice. So given time, I will share with you the specifics of what I have gone through as a prosecutor, and then we can continue to, to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think we might actually just move down the row of people that we've got here. Uh, we've now got uh, Simone who's, who's going to uh, make some initial comments. Sure. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I see that we're all echoing the point that genocide is a process. And it's not only a process that um, is completed during the 100 days of hell that happened in Rwanda while the international community stand, stood by. But that process of hate speech, of denial, of impunity continues after. And it was in existence before the genocide as well, as Martin rightly points out. For over 30 years, there were massacres, and no one was held accountable for them. And I like how Alison DeForge from Human Rights Watch, who's written probably one of the most important books about the genocide, and sets out all the evidence about how this was planned, um, says, and that there were rehearsals as well. Um, and often those rehearsals were involving hate speech. Um, we know that the Holocaust didn't start with the gas chambers, it started with hate speech. And something that was very concerning to me was how even during the trials, denial was used <coughs> as a tactic. I came from a law firm as a defense attorney around the corner where I served for seven years, I believed in being a zealous defense lawyer and the rights of the accused, and I still do today. But I was shocked when I joined the UN, it was my first job, of what the defense was. I expect the defense to be what defenses are in, in normal courts, which is, um, I was just following orders, we saw that in Nuremberg. Or, um, I didn't know what was going on, right? Sure. Or, what we call it in New York City parlance, a Saudi defense, some other dude did it, right? <laughs> but that's not what I saw during my 230 days on trial. Most of the time, and Martin was a witness to this, they were debating whether there was a genocide or not. This is how the defense lawyers from all over the world were spending time um, defending their clients in what they were saying was a zealous way. And it was quite frustrating to us to watch that every day, that their tactic they wanted to call witnesses that said that there were no genocide, expert witnesses, people who were completely intellectually dishonest. Um, and it was quite frustrating, right? And the trial started in 1997, the first trial in January 1997. And the case that I prosecuted involving three media officials who were responsible for batting the flames of genocide in um, their newspaper and radio station took place from 2000 to 2003. And it wasn't until 2006, in the Karamara case, that finally the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda took judicial notice that a genocide occurred in Rwanda in 1994 against the Tutsi. And so it became more difficult for the accused to continue to run this um, intellectually dishonest line of defense that there was no genocide. And what went in hand with hand with that kind of defense that we were watching every day and trying to fight was that um, their other line of defense was that the uh, Rwandan patriotic forces, the RPF, who were the only ones who came to the aid of those in Rwanda who were perishing, 
um, were responsible for the genocide because they had shot the president's plane down. And I would listen to this every day, that they wanted to put evidence about the plane crash and the plane crash. And at one point I found myself in my Hillary Clinton Benghazi moment where I said, and Martin was there that day where I said, I really don't care about hearing about this plane crash anymore. It doesn't matter. How do you justify one million people being exterminated because of their identity? Um, but that was part of the denial. Another part of the denial continued even after the convictions. And we saw that the last trial in the ICTR um, occurred in 2012. And these people who were convicted in the ICTR were those who bore the greatest responsibility. They were lawyers, they were doctors, they were priests, they were business people. They were, some of them were not Rwandan. There was a French, a Belgian uh, journalist as well, George Reggio, who was convicted. And um, what I found during the trial was that none of them, with rare exception, maybe one of them, Reggio did express some um, remorse about his actions, but most of them expressed no remorse. They denied the genocide. They uh, continued to deny it while they were in, in prison. And um, when the tribunal in 2012 started releasing so many of them for early release, instead of looking at how you release people, determining are they still a danger to society, have they made amends, have they accepted responsibility for their actions, are their crimes so heinous, shocking the conscience of humanity that probably you don't even release somebody for a crime like that. Uh, but if you do, there should be conditions. And there were no conditions. And I look at you know, all the witnesses who testified in the trial um, in the media case that I prosecuted and how they found out um, that accused were let go because by the radio, the same radio that was persecuting them and, and listing their families and their names so that they could be exterminated. That's how they found out that these accused were released. Um, and the accused that I prosecuted, who was sentenced to life and then appealed his sentence and was sentenced to 35 years, um, was let go by a judge in the tribunal because it was presumed he was re rehabilitated because he had reached the very old age of 65 um, and uh, because uh, uh, he had good conduct in jail. Um, and this was the basis for the release. And by 2012, so many had been released. And that's another form of denial. And that's also another form of impunity. And I will tell you that that very Ferdinand Mahimana, who was a university professor who started radio television, RTLM, which broadcasted genocide from July of 1993 through July of 1994, told me when he was convicted, and speaking to Martin about this, I will get out one day. He knew it. And if you listen to the radio station that was during the genocide, um, mentioning people's names and where they lived and who should be killed and break that small Tutsi's nose. The same thing that we saw happen during the Holocaust when we saw them talking about Jews as animals and dehumanizing them. And, and we saw the same kind of language in, in Rwanda. Um, and for 20% of those convicted to have been given early release, with no conditions. In Sierra Leone Tribunal, for example, you have to make amends, you have to accept responsibility. Um, in the ICTR, that didn't happen. I understand now that things are changing and there will maybe some reasons given before any releases um, happen in the future. And it's not about saying that lock them up and throw away the key. It's about remembering these are crimes that shock the conscience of humanity and these are, for the most part, unrepented violent extremists. And that's what we need to call them. Um, I just wanted to show you some examples of what the hate speech was. I had the opportunity during the trial to go to the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, and I'll just show two slides to give a better idea, and then maybe we can talk more about hate speech in the Q&A. So if we can show the first slide. Um, so this is Kangura newspaper, um, the three people who we prosecuted in the media trial, and that was the first trial where um, the actions of the media were being held to account for causing genocide and flaming the, and fanning the, fl the flames of genocide since Nuremberg, when we saw Julius Streicher um, prosecuted for his newspaper, Der Sturmer. Kangura started publishing in 1990, and this is an issue from 1991, and you see in the center a hexagon at the top that says um, 
the last two words being Rubai ben Namunshi, which means majority people. So Kangora always had on its masthead that it was the voice dedicated to awakening and protecting the majority people. And under that, you see Batutsi, Bwoko, Bumana, the Tutsi, God's race. Sounds similar to what we always were saying about Jews. They're the chosen people. They think they're God's race, right? Trying to build that kind of resentment in the population. And then you see, um, uh, in the left rectangular box adjacent to the machete. Mm -hmm. What weapons shall we use to conquer the cockroaches for once and for all? And that's how Tutsis were regularly referred to by the Hutu extremist government as cockroaches, in the same way Jews are referred to as animals, because it's much easier to kill an animal or to be incited to kill an animal than it is a human being. And then the heading at the uh, very bottom of the photo um, says, where there's a picture of the um, first Hutu power president, Gregoire Kaibanda, it says, how about relaunching the Hutu revolution of 1959 so that we can conquer the Tutsi cockroaches, right? So on top of that, what weapons shall we use to conquer the cockroaches for once and for all? And now showing the machete. I mean, what kind of message is this? Um, and so what happened to the international community? I'll just tell you, how did they react to it when this first came out? Well, Amnesty International and other very well reputed human rights groups said this is free speech and that Hassan and Daisy who was jailed in 1990 should be let out of jail that you are violating his rights by keeping him in jail and so he continued to publish this newspaper and we have to think about at what point do we stop speech like this do we wait until it's already caused a genocide or do we do something about it beforehand and there were options in Rwanda. They could have bombed the antenna if they didn't want to get involved in a war on the ground because they were worried about what happened in Somalia and the international community. They could have stopped this antenna. They could have had the Navy jam the airwaves, which would have cost $8,500 an hour. But the National Security Administration said that that was too expensive and that that might violate free speech. Nothing was done. And I look at what's out there today, and it's very disturbing because hate speech is really spreading like wildfire. And I'll just show one last slide, and then maybe we can talk about how do we handle this in the future, and maybe in the Q&A I can give some of my thoughts about that. And you look at this over here, seeing the Star of David, Defend Your Nation, Blood and Soil Org. These were flyers that were disseminated widely after Charlottesville. This one was found at the University of Delaware on various um, um, uh, trees put all over as banners. Um, what does that say? The idea is always be vigilant. They're coming to take your land. They hate you. If you don't get them, they're going to get you. And I think we have to take this very seriously. And I don't think we're taking it seriously enough. And we're getting better at monitoring it, but we're not good at addressing it. And as social media has become very difficult for older people to understand and to react to, we need to become much more technologically savvy. Because it, in Rwanda, it was the radio and the newspaper, and today it's social media and the internet. And we do not have a good international response, and it's only becoming more trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Simone. We're, we're going to keep moving down the, the side here. So, Michael, would you like to? I, I believe you've got some uh, PowerPoint for us as well, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, hello everybody, and Ambassador, thank you for inviting me. I am humbled to be part of this program today. It's a very important one. Um, I started at Case Western 17 years ago, which was the same year that Bruce Klatsky, who happens to be in the back of the room, endowed our human rights program. And because of that endowment, people like Robert Kayinamara who is the legal advisor of the Rwanda mission, and my student, a star student, were able to do work on the Rwanda genocide. And we've had graduates of my program that I taught, um, like Chris Rossi, who worked for a judge of the Rwanda tribunal, and Andres Perez, who was a prosecutor and appellate prosecutor at the Rwanda tribunal. And so um, my work at the law school has continued to be very involved in this, including just last month when I published my 19th book, um, which is, were you able to cue this up? <laughs> She's working on it. Um, so my, my 19th book, which is a book about the legacy of the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is the positive legacies of these tribunals 
And it would be really helpful if, if we had my PowerPoint slides um, queued up. If not, I can, I can pass it to the next speaker while you work out the technical. You want to do that? All right, I'll be back. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. Zach, is that okay? That's fine. <laughs> because my, my back was to the whole a, a third of the room, I thought I would just stand uh, during my initial remarks. That's okay. Here, Michael. Uh, hello. <laughs> hello, Morocco. Uh, thank you, Marcosi, for uh, for having me here today. Um, it's an honor to be with you as we commemorate the 25th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi. I'm going to use my uh, brief introductory remarks to talk about 10 lessons that I, I take and many of us take from the genocide. Uh, and um, some people, some of us have already covered some of this material, but uh, I'll echo it as well. So lesson one, as the ambassador said and my fellow panelists have also echoed, uh, hate speech is dangerous. Um, in the years leading up to the Tutsi genocide, Hutu extremists monopolized and manipulated media to differentiate, dehumanize, and to demonize Tutsi. And such propaganda mobilized hundreds of thousands of other Hutu who felt compelled to attack Tutsi. The genocide against the Tutsi should remind the world, including our elected officials here in the United States, to scrupulously avoid inflaming tensions, amplifying hatred, or emboldening attacks. Lesson two, atrocity prevention is possible. Historians have documented how the UN and certain countries, including the United States, France, and Belgium, were aware of the genocide as it was happening and declined to respond effectively. If the UN had even modestly bolstered its peacekeeping presence already in the country, it would likely have deterred or mitigated crimes against humanity. Genocide and other atrocity crimes continue to rage around the world, from Syria and South Sudan to Myanmar and Yemen. And earlier this year, as, as has already been noted, uh, and as I had the, pri the privilege of participating in when I served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee two years ago, the U.S. government enacted the bipartisan Elie Wiesel and Genocide Atrocities Prevention Act. And given that atrocity prevention is achievable, this law's laudable rhetoric should finally become reality. Lesson three, tr transitional justice is essential. The Tutsi Genocide in 1994 was only the latest in a series of atrocity crimes that Rwanda suffered over the prior half century. Impunity for those earlier, smaller scale offenses contributed to the massive conflagration later. And four major, major transitional justice mechanisms were implemented to address the Tutsi Genocide. Two were outside Rwanda, prosecutions in the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and in foreign courts, and two were inside Rwanda prosecutions by ordinary domestic courts in Gachacha. These forums have sought to change what had been in Rwanda a culture of impunity to one of accountability. Still, the work these innovative bodies have accomplished is not yet complete. Suspected genocide remain at large. <coughs> the conviction of Jean Leonard de Gagne in Boston just last month in, in uh, US federal court for lying about his role in the 2 c genocide on his immigration application is a stark reminder that identifying and bringing genocide to justice is an ongoing challenge and imperative, including here in the United States. Lesson four, women's rights are crucial. Rwanda genocide deliberately used rape and sexual mutilation as tools to spread HIV AIDS, torture and terrorize women and girls, reduce, reduce procreation among Tutsi and destroy the entire Tutsi population. Some researchers have concluded that as many as half a million women, including almost all surviving female Tutsi, suffered sexual assaults during the genocide. The Me Too movement has emphasized how prevalent sexual abuse is here in the United States as well, even in a non-genocidal context. As in Rwanda, such offenses demonstrate the rampant objectification and exploitation of women and girls, that persists throughout history and across societies. We must do more to prevent and punish such crimes, including by promoting and protecting women's rights. Lesson five, women's representation is critical. Recognizing that women were targeted during the genocide against the Tutsi and should play a significant role in reconstruction and reconciliation post-genocide Rwanda instituted a 30% quota for women in elected office. Soon Rwanda more than doubled that minimum. By 2013, women had won 64% of 
of seats in Parliament's lower house, making Rwanda the world's leader in the proportion of women in a national legislature. Given studies showing the benefits of female political leadership, especially for initiatives to combat violence and to foster gender equality, the rest of the world should follow Rwanda's lead in promoting a greater role for women in government by identifying, recruiting, training, and supporting female candidates. Lesson six, genocide education is necessary. It's often said that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so not only is it shocking how many people are ignorant about even basic facts of genocide, but it's also perilous. Genocide education can also help to combat genocide denial. Ten U.S. states have already mandated some, some form of Holocaust and genocide studies, uh, excuse me, genocide education. And given the egregiousness and persistence of atrocity crimes, genocide education should be required everywhere. Lesson seven, political will is vital. As with Jews, Armenians, and others targeted for genocidal slaughter, the world abandoned the Tutsi in their greatest time of need. Since 1994, the international community has developed more infrastructure, laws, norms, including the responsibility to protect, and technology to combat genocide. While necessary, these and other developments are insufficient to prevent or even mitigate genocide. Political will remains vital to preventing and stopping genocide, and that crucial ingredient in the prevention of genocide formula remains elusive. We must demand that our representatives meaningfully counteract genocide and other atrocity crimes. Lesson eight, supporting survivors is fundamental. The damage wrought by genocide physically, emotionally, and financially is unfathomable. And such harm isn't just limited to direct survivors. Studies show that genocide trauma is intergenerational. With compassion and respect for their dignity, human rights, and autonomy, we should help survivors heal and rebuild as much as possible through providing physical and mental health services, housing, economic compensation, access to justice, and other programs. Lesson nine, upstanderism is imperative. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. declared, man's inhumanity to man is not only perpetrated by the vitriolic inaction, excuse me, vitriolic actions of those who are bad, it's also perpetrated by the vitiating inaction of those who are good. Such bystanderism enables atrocity crimes. While every genocide, including the Tutsi genocide, features instances of rescue and resistance, we must study and raise awareness about such upstanderism to understand how it occurs, to consider how it may be supported, and to identify it as possible model behavior. And the tenth and final lesson, never again, is unfulfilled. My fellow genocide prevention scholars and practitioners often end anniversary reflections like this one by invoking never again. I will as well, but not in the way that the phrase is usually used. Never again is typically employed to declare that humanity will no longer permit uh, targeting of a group for extermination. But given that genocides have continued, this pronouncement has proven insufficient and hollow. So drawing from the previous nine lessons, I invoke never again differently. Never again must we take hate speech lightly, as some of them say. Never again must we think preventing or st stopping genocide is impossible. Never again must we allow impunity for genocide. Never again must we fail to protect women's rights. Never again must we decline to promote women's political representation. Never again must we disregard genocide education and denial. Never again must we permit genocide unwillingness, political unwillingness, to address genocide. Never again must we neglect genocide survivors. Never again must we be bystanders to genocide. And never again must, must we declare never again unless we remember and implement these lessons. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Zach. All right, I think we have ironed out our uh, multimedia issues. So I'm back, back, back to um, you, Mark. And I apologize that this picture has been up because it was only supposed to be there for two seconds. Um, but I do want to talk about the positive legacy of the Rwanda Tribunal. And while the world is still full of horrors that are not quite as bad, but they are really horrible. Um, for example, what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in South Sudan, what's still going on in Darfur, what's going on to the Rohingya in Burma. Um, there has been international legal progress 
And a lot of that has to do with the situation in Rwanda and its aftermath. It really all starts out with Nuremberg. And as some of the speakers started today's speech, saying that's where the idea of holding people accountable took hold. In fact, at the time that Nuremberg was being negotiated and the three great powers were trying to figure out what to do with the Nazis as World War II was ending, there were two options that they were talking about, and neither of them were trials. They said, should we kill all the surviving Nazis with firing squads or with mass hanging? And in the end, they decided to do trials, and in part, the reason was because they wanted to deter future incidents rather than create another cycle of revenge and violence. And this goes back to Hitler's famous words in 1939 as he was initiating the war in Poland, which was a total war and had some of the worst atrocities. And his German uh, generals said, we're not comfortable with what you're asking us to do. And he said, oh, don't worry. Quote, who after all today remembers the fate of the Armenians? And because of the Nuremberg trials, nobody says who remembers the fate of the six million Jews who perished under Hitler's hands. And because of the Rwanda tribunal trials and the other accountability mechanisms, including the Tatcha and the crime stat, uh, tr the trials all over Europe and the rest of the world, nobody has forgotten the Tutsis. But after World War II, there was a period of time when there were atrocities all over the world and nobody was doing anything about it. You had the Idi Amin atrocities, Stalin's atrocities in the Soviet Union, Mao's uh, massive deaths in China, Pol Pot's in Cambodia, Pinochet, Devalier, and Saddam Hussein. And the UN declared that it was a golden age of impunity. The High Commissioner for Human Rights said a person stood a better chance of being prosecuted for killing one person or 10 people than killing 10,000 or a million. Well, that all changed in 1993 when I happened to be at the State Department at a rare period of time of cooperation in the international community. And that's when the Yugoslavia Tribunal was created. And a year after that, the horrible genocide broke out in Rwanda, and the Prime Minister designate, who was a Tutsi, came to the United Nations and said, is it because we are Africans that you do not create a tribunal for us, but you created one for the Yugoslav Bosnian victims? And very shortly after that, the Rwanda Tribunal was launched. The Rwanda Tribunal um, was launched and led to a number of other tribunals, and now we live in an age of accountability. But was the Rwanda Tribunal a success? And this slide tells you what the mission of the Rwanda Tribunal was. Um, they had five important goals to deter future violations, to break the cycle of violence, to establish a historic record, to bring the guilty to justice, and to serve as a model for future trials. Now by the numbers, the Rwanda Tribunal was quite extraordinary. 93 defendants were indicted. The trials began in 97 and ended in 2015. 3,000 witnesses testified and there were 5,800 days of proceedings. There was a historic record that can be looked at all over the world and never denied. 62 of the defendants were convicted, 14 were acquitted. This shows both that it was an effective tribunal and a fair tribunal. The convicted defendants were not just low foot soldiers, they included some of the highest ranking civilian leaders, military leaders, and even private citizens in the country. And the tribunal cost a total of $2 billion. The international community stood up and paid the price for international justice to occur. Now, the tribunal established some amazing precedents that are very important and have pushed international criminal law forward. It was the first tribunal to have a conviction for genocide. We talk about genocide coming out of uh, the Nuremberg trials. That was not prosecuted at Nuremberg. The genocide convention was not until three years after Nuremberg. But this was the first tribunal to prosecute successfully and convict for genocide. It was the first tribunal to take judicial notice of genocide. After all, these defense counsel argued for hours and hours whether or not there was a genocide and the first conviction said yes there was, they said we're not going to relitigate that and they took judicial notice. It was the first to recognize rape as a means of committing genocide. It was the first to hold 
that the number that members of the media could be held responsible for incitement to genocide. And it was the first to hold a civilian liable under command responsibility for unleashing the genocide of his subordinates. Its legacy has been first that it has led to the responsibility to protect doctrine, which is an evolving doctrine that may someday be able to stop the next time that there is a genocide. Uh, Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the UN, challenged the international community to have a new doctrine to prevent the next Rwanda from occurring. And under the responsibility to protect doctrine, countries have a responsibility to stop genocide, and when they can't or won't, the international community has a responsibility to do it for them. And when the Security Council is paralyzed, this doctrine says the international community, individual states, coalitions of states may act even without the approval of the Security Council. That's still in high debate, but it is moving forward. Um, the permanent international criminal court would not exist if it wasn't for first the Yugoslavia Tribunal and then the Rwanda Tribunal showing that international justice can work. And finally, the idea of universal jurisdiction, which is that there are certain crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and massive war crimes that can be prosecuted anywhere by any country, even if the perpetrators are not nationals of that country, and even if the place where it occurred was not in the territory of that country. For a while, that was out of, uh, that was in disrepute. Um, there was a time when Belgium and Germany and Spain had tried to prosecute leaders, including Ariel Sharon, um, and this led to the international community frowning on universal jurisdiction. In the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide, those trials began again. And now we're seeing in Europe trials of people who committed atrocities in Syria who would not be prosecuted anywhere else but for universal jurisdiction. So people sometimes ask me, you know, Michael, how can you be such an upbeat person when your expertise and when you spend all your time writing, researching, and working on genocide and crimes against humanity? And the answer is because there is hope that when we work on these issues, the world slowly gets better, that people do not forget the lessons of the past, that never again starts to mean something. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Michael. And uh, we're running a bit late, so uh, I've just been told to keep it very tight. But I did want to make sure that we come back to our panelists and, and ask some follow-up questions. So maybe actually I'll start with you, Simone. I'm going to take people out of order here. But you talked a lot about hate speech and a lot about media and the role of, for example, Radio Colleen in, in 1994. What do you think can be learned from that in terms of the of hate speech that we see today. So for example, I'm sure everyone in this room is aware that <laughs> Facebook played a very important role during the recent genocide in Myanmar. Um, so what do you think lessons can be learned in terms of these new media? Yeah, interestingly, Mark Zuckerberg um, sent some lobbies out in Washington, D.C. to say that he wants government to restrict speech now. And when he did, he had to immediately retract that. Google um, and all of the other platforms, Twitter, are against um, any kind of prescription of speech. Um, and the United States um, sits on an island of its own where it is vehemently against any kind of restrictions of speech, but we have to look at in other contexts that are not the United States, where there's no independent judiciary, where minorities are being um, persecuted. Um, do we have to maybe have stricter protections there? But how do you tailor that when we're now dealing with a global society where we have the internet, we just, just have a newspaper or radio station in one particular society? So what can we do about it? A couple of things. The first thing is we need to move from early um, uh, warning systems to early action systems. We need to not only monitor, but we need to address hate speech. And that can be done by um, helping people with proliferating counter narratives. You know, that's something that has been successful in terms of um, stemming some uh, violent extremism and terrorism by making sure that other narratives have, uh, you know, space for their ideas. And the other thing we can do is support victims of hate speech. We don't think about them as actual victims, you know. Um, they are victims. And support those who are fighting hate speech because they're at risk, many of them. Um, education on how to responsibly navigate the internet, that's really important too. Teaching our kids not to pass this on. 
um, and what to do when they identify it. And finally, one of the things, and I'll end with this, that member states have now all committed themselves to do is to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And Goal 16 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that we're all supposed to, as governments, reach by 2030 involves having peaceful and just inclusive societies and making sure that there is not dangerous hate speech being proliferated and us just standing by as we did in Rwanda is key to achieving that goal. And I will just end with a plug for one of the co-organizers here. Um, Martine was speaking on behalf of Adam Adyang, the Special Advisor on the Prevention of uh, Genocide. Right now, the Secretary General of the United Nations has tasked his office with developing an action plan for the UN to finally, for the first time, address hate speech and do something about it and stop being so immobilized by our discomfort about um, restricting speech because we might step on the rights of human rights of, um, defenders. We can manage that. It is the minorities who are being stomped on. It is not the human rights defenders necessarily who are going to be, um, you know, uh, caught up in the net of having too restrictive speech. There is a balance and we need to address it and not just be immobilized by fear that we might somehow overreach. Thank you for that, Simone. Zach, I'm gonna come to you. There, you uh, you kind of gave us the 10 commandments of genocide prevention there uh, that you ran through. So I guess my question to you is just to pick out uh, one of those. You talked about <laughs> education and the importance of education and how that it had happened in the United States. I can't remember exactly what the number was of the number of states who were, who were doing this. Do you think that's made a difference in countries like the United States in terms of raising the general citizens' awareness not only about the past, but, but also about what needs to be done right now in the present? Um, thank you, Simon. Um, well, uh, actually the data is not encouraging. Um, so there, a recent study came out uh, about millennials uh, in, in the United States. I think it was commissioned by the ADL, uh, though I'm not sure, I think it was ADL. And um, it showed that uh, some shocking uh, percentage of young people are com can't name a single concentration or death camp uh, from the Holocaust, uh, and um, simply do not or will not believe that uh, six million Jews were killed uh, during the Holocaust. Um, and, and apparently this, this, uh, this proportion uh, of the American population is higher than, um, than in recent uh, history. And this is also amid the time that we have 10 states um, that now require uh, some form of Holocaust in, in genocide studies. Uh, and, um, and more states are, are making headway in, in terms of passing state legislation to require uh, such education in, um, in school. And so, uh, no, uh, unfortunately, it's unclear um, to what degree this mandated education is, is making a difference if we look at, at the most recent um, data. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned in my, in my opening remarks, genocide education is not just about, about the past, of course. Um, it's about learning lessons for, for contemporary society and for the future. We also have seen hate crimes spike uh, since uh, President Trump took office. Uh, since um, he did, uh, he crimes a spike 17% as reported uh, by the FBI each year. And in counties, this is an amazing statistic, in counties in which President Trump delivered campaign speeches uh, in his uh, lead up to the election, compared to counties in which he did not, hate crimes have been reported 226%, uh, an increase of 226% in the counties in which he delivered uh, speeches. And so both in terms of uh, basic knowledge of genocide, including the Holocaust and uh, hate crimes. Maybe the NSA is trying to prevent me from speaking. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's, it's a disturbing uh, trend. And um, I think that this shows that we need um, more, ed more, more education and more, uh, and more monitoring of, of hate crimes and, and more response to them uh, through prosecution and other preventative actions. Thank you. Those are some very disturbing numbers. That's actually the reason why I picked out that particular uh, point that you made, because I read that report and it kind of sent a, a chill right down my, my spine. Uh, Michael, could I, could I come to you maybe? Um, I like the way you focus on that 
very narrow period where he said it was the end of the era of, uh, of impunity and when we saw these tribunals set up. And also for those of you who are uh, UN nerds like myself, this was also the great period of UN peacekeeping as well. I think in the previous six decades or something there had only been four UN missions and then there was something like 12 or 14 set up in a 12 month period. So there was this great period of kind of multilateralism and cooperation around international justice and around peacekeeping and, and trying to make the world a better place. We now live in this era in a deeply divided era and you need to look down the road here at First Avenue and the UN Security Council and what's happening to the permanent members to see how incapable they are to even doing something substantive around trying to stop the civil war in Syria. So I guess my question to you is what kind of what can be done therefore in the absence of kind of that that climate of cooperation to bring perpetrators, to bring genocide to justice today in Syria, Myanmar and elsewhere? So interestingly, in the international system, for every action, there is a reaction. And the current action is that in the Security Council, the United States and Russia are vetoing each other's resolutions or threatening to do so, and China has jumped in as well. So you have an age of paralysis now, which is similar to the Cold War. Now, the reaction to that has been that the UN General Assembly has stepped up and found new power that it did not know that it possessed and that the Security Council did not necessarily want it to possess. And this occurred first and most um, clearly in the case of Syria where the Security Council had a resolution to create an investigation of um, the use of chemical weapons and of the crimes against humanity that were being committed there and Russia vetoed it not once but three times and the General Assembly decided that it had the power to create the triple IM the independent international investigation mechanism and I'm not exactly sure if I got that the impartial um, but the triple IM now is something that only the Security Council had previously been able to create but the General Assembly created it and it's been launched then um, in Burma, same thing happened. You had veto when they tried to create an investigation, and this time the Human Rights Commission found that it could create its own triple IM, and that has now been launched. Um, we also see that when the United States tried to get authorization to use force against chemical weapons facilities, and the Security Council vetoed that, the United States, the United Kingdom, and France together took matters into their own hands. And what was really important about the action that occurred on April 14th, a year ago, was that it was the first time that humanitarian intervention was used and that the argument at the Security Council was that it was legal under the theory of humanitarian intervention. In the past, they had said this was, you know, it was necessary for moral reasons, but they refused to give a legal articulation. And this is the first time this legal articulation occurred. Um, this was widely supported, and there is now an evolving doctrine, I believe, of responsibility to protect that's more robust than it was when it was originally created, in part because of the reaction of what I think was an abuse of the veto. It is when the permanent members are using the veto in cases where there is genocide or crimes against humanity, and they are stopping the Security Council from taking action, the, the pendulum swing seems to be that the rest of the international community will not sit by. They'll find a way to take action. And I think that's what we're starting to see. Thank you for that. And, and I, I left you for last because I, I really want to end, uh, if we can, on, on this particular question. You talked a lot about bystanders. And of course, as I think Zach mentioned, and the flip side of this question is the whole notion of upstanders as well. And in any situation of mass atrocities of genocide, we see both phenomena. You can't, I think the ambassador has given some very powerful speeches of this. You can't have a genocide unless you have bystanders. Um, and you stop it by having upstanders, either before it ever happens or even you have rescuers who act in the process. And it's shocking. And there's some of those figures that you gave about the number of fugitives from justice who are still roaming around the streets of, of Europe and other countries in the world, the genocide from, from Rwanda. So my question to you is, 
what more can be done, including by people in this room, including by ordinary people, regardless of, of what you do for a job and where you live in the world, uh, to make sure that we have more upstanders and that we help bring some of these people to justice? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, the figures I give, I believe, are not exhaustive. Uh, the number may sound, sound alarming, but talking about uh, 1,089 indictments in a situation where we had 1 million people, more than 1 million people killed, that's really not exhaustive. Those are the ones we have been able to identify, do the investigation, completed the files and issue indictments. But I believe the number of perpetrators who are still out there and who have not been shown is even bigger. So what do we do? Uh, first of all is to keep this memory alive, to, to acknowledge the fact that we still have this challenge. Because justice is not represented. We appreciate what the ISTR has done and what we have done so far. But to the extent we can, justice is specific individual specific. Every known perpetrator must face a day in court. So we need a critical mass of people who are willing to stand for this case. Uh, what we are doing is part of that process. Two, we need to depoliticize the process of justice. Because out of Rwanda, to a, a large extent, a justice, the need for justice has been treated as an academic or a political exercise. If I can give a few examples. For, for more than, for the entire period I was a prosecutor, I was pursuing six suspects from the United Kingdom. I worked with the Crown Prosecution, we investigated, we were able to prove for a British court that they had a prima facie case to answer. Uh, so the, the minimum of evidence required for them to be in court was established. But the challenge was, can they be extracted, extradited back to one? Uh, the British courts, through to the highest court, uh, decided against extradition to Rwanda. Even when they were not in a position to start a process of internal prosecution. Uh, but why? why? Why is this the situation? Because Rwanda is one single jurisdiction in the world that has handled the biggest number of genocide cases. No one can claim that reality from Rwanda. We have done more than three million cases through Gachacha process. We have done several hundred cases through regular prosecutions. So we appreciate any other complementary process. But we reject any attempt to say Rwanda is not a jurisdiction that can deal with the genocide cases. Because even the, this ICTR statute recognized that Rwanda and ICTR had concurrent jurisdiction. So in terms of law, it's a jurisdiction that is recognized as competent. It is only politics that is still refusing to acknowledge that. So as we speak, it's only a few weeks back that there was a debate in the British Parliament, is it the House of Commons, about these cases. So the argument is not whether they should be in court because that's already decided. The argument is whether they can be sent to Rwanda. Another example, in the United States, where I'm grateful that we have been able to bring back to Rwanda several suspects from the United States. But none of them had, has been brought under extradition arrangement. Actually, what happens is to bring evidence on the involvement of genocide to prove the case uh, on violation of immigration laws in the United States. So the convictions that take place here are not on genocide as such, but they are convictions based on violation of the laws of America as it gets to extradition to immigration. So when they are brought to Rwanda, it is actually deportation. It, it is not extradition. So why do we shy away from that? It, 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 yes, final, the final destination is in Rwanda, yes. But it shouldn't be extradition. It doesn't have to be through the shortcut of looking for more convenient uh, phraseology. 
So I, I think we need it to be politicized the process. And this is not about the Western countries only. Actually, the biggest number of fugitives are in African countries, including our own neighbors. So what, what we have learned is that really, even with overwhelming evidence in terms of the number of victims and people coming up to tell their stories, these two young ladies who are just 10 years old, when the genocide happens, are now able to tell what happened to them. So it's, it's never enough. So the, the, the process to, to depoliticize post-genocide justice is, 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 a, is a challenge. It's, it's a challenge that we, we still have to face. Uh, face together a critical mass we need. The, somebody who caused a debate in the House of Commons was just a single member who have been to Rwanda several times and went back to the British Parliament to question why these people are not brought to justice. So his single statement was taken uh, more seriously than my 10 years efforts of coming with evidence and inviting the British prosecutors to Rwanda for investigation. Final, another final example. We have several fugitives in France. Uh, there is a case, one of them, because they have not been able to prosecute, I think, as in the case so far, completely. There was a case in which French investigators came to Rwanda 39 times to investigate. So what kind of investigation is that? 39 times. Every time you come, you meet witnesses, you go back, you come back. Uh, so, in, in, all in all is that there is a level of indifference, there is a level of politicization, there is a level of treating uh, genocide justice as a mere academic exercise. And we have to work together to deal with that situation. So we may not completely succeed because, again, although there is no statute of limitation on cases of genocide, but when witnesses have a lifespan, there shall come a time when we don't have people to come as witnesses in court. But at least uh, what we are able to do now, we should be able to do it. Thank you for that. Um, we are running late, and uh, I want to make sure that we get all this done. We're only running a couple of minutes behind schedule. So a, a couple of things I, I, I need to say. First of all, I got strict instructions from the ambassador. We had lunch together, and she said, uh, you must sum up very well, and I'm very worried that I won't get invited to lunch again if I don't do a good job. <laughs> so the pressure is very much on me here. And on that note, I do want to thank, uh, of course, the Rwandan Mission, the Ambassador, uh, the AJC, and the panelists uh, for being part of this event uh, today. And I was told that Kwebuka 25 has three principal themes. The first is impunity in the battle against impunity. The second, of course, is the ongoing battle against genocide denial. And the third is the importance of youth. And the next panel is very much going to be about that. I just wanted to say very quickly about that in relation to the comments that have been made by all of our speakers. You know, we have such a long way to go, 25 years after the genocide, and we still have such a long way to go. On the first question of impunity, uh, I would say there's no question for me as a, a, from where I come from, for people who come from here in the United States, or people who come from any country in the world, wherever these genocide yeah, are fugitives from justice, they must be hunted down. They should be extradited to Rwanda. But if your country is unprepared to extradite them to Rwanda, then I think the argument has to become one about universal jurisdiction. Put them on trial then, in a courtroom, wherever they are, and hold them accountable for what they did 25 years ago. On the second question of denial, I mean, this is something that you said, Zach, kind of provoked a memory in me. You know, my earliest encounter with a Holocaust survivor is actually when I was about 11 years of age. And uh, she came to our class, an Auschwitz survivor, and told her story. And afterwards, she made every kid in the class line up in a single file line and come down to her and meet her one to one. And she would have her arm out with her tattoo on it. it was very, and as a kid, I was 11. It, it seemed weird. And she was whispering something to them. So I couldn't wait, of course, being a curious kid, to get to the front of the line and find out what secret she was whispering. 
And she made each of us touch the tattoo on her arm and rub it. And she whispered in your ear, one day people will tell you this never happened. And I can remember at the time, and as I became a teenager thinking, that crazy Jewish woman, someday people will say this never happened. So to be living in the era where we are, where you can see people waving swastikas on American streets, where you see the return of the far right in Europe, and you see, it terrifies me that we're losing people like, her name was Hilda Freiburg, who could tell that story and speak about it from a first-hand perspective. There is so much genocide denialism already around Rwanda. What's going to happen when this generation age out and the generation who are coming up behind, the ones who are children, you know, they have to keep telling their stories. And I think it therefore becomes in Cumbered upon all of us. You don't have to be Rwandan. You don't have to be Jewish to talk about the Holocaust. You just have to care, and it's your obligation as a human being to talk about what happened and why it mustn't ever happen again. The third thing I wanted to say, very, very quickly, is my family comes from a, a lovely little seaside village called Belfast in the north of Ireland. <laughs> you may have heard of it. And so, you know, we had our own uh, little armed conflict not genocidal at all, but bad things happened, including bad things that happened to uh, my own family. And of course, in that context, there is a lot of talk about the politics of revenge. People sometimes think about it, unfortunately, that way. And I always think about a mural that was painted in our area, an area called Anderson's Town in West Belfast. And that mural had in really big words on it, our revenge will be the laughter of our children. And after many years of going to Rwanda, and there was a definite heaviness when I first started going to Rwanda in the years after the genocide, I'm, I'm not going to lie, it was a heavy place to go to. And there was a heaviness in people's hearts after everything that had been through. But the years go on, you know, 15 years, we're now up to 25 years. You know, and I was recently at a place which the Rwandans here will know of called Marambi, uh, which I've visited you know, for more than two decades, I guess I've been going there, since before there was a memorial there. There's no more memorial there. It was a, a very large, uh, it was a school and a very large killing site during the genocide. I think there was something like 20,000 people killed uh, at Marambi. And I was standing there, it's on a hill, and you know, the country has changed so much, but one of the most strange and incongruous things was we're standing at this genocidal site and you could hear the sounds of the kids playing in the local village, playing ordinary everyday games, drifting up to where we were as well. And so I think Rwanda has had the ultimate revenge, which is that it has built a prosperous society. It has passed on to the next generation of Rwandans a better Rwanda than the Rwanda that they inherited and that their parents inherited. And that is the ultimate revenge, I think. So thank you all for your attention here today, and uh, we're going to wrap up this panel. Thank you. That was a remarkable panel. Thank you so much. I just want to do the assignment for moderating it. <coughs> Zach mentioned some very troubling statistics about the ignorance about things past. 